Sure. Welcome to the Music Reel. I'm your host, Nicola Burton. I'm very excited about my chat today. I've got with me Dr. Russell Kennedy. He's a neuroscientist, a medical doctor. He is an author, a speaker, comedian, talking to us from Canada. Russ, it is a pleasure to see you, my friend. How are you? Nice to finally meet you or cyber meet you, Nikki. It's yes. great. Yes, we're cyber meeting everyone these days. Let's start with where you are right now. You're in which part of Canada are you in, Russ? I'm in the farthest part of the west coast of Canada, so Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. Right. So how is the COVID crazy going for you guys right now? Well, we are on an island. So Vancouver Island, it's a pretty big island, but uh, it's it's actually doing fairly well here. We, you know, we, we haven't really been hit hard with it. Everybody kind of came together. We have a bit of an island mentality here. We're a lot more laid back in general. I used to live in Vancouver, which is just across the water from me by ferry. And they're a lot more intense over there, you know. So Victoria is about 300,000 people. Vancouver is about, you know, 3 million. So it's quite a different lifestyle over here. So we're we're quite a bit more laid back. And I think that does play a role in, in you know, our immune systems. I think that we're, our immune systems are a lot stronger because I think we just generally feel more connected to each other over here. Because you go to Vancouver and... I get off the, the the ferry and it's it's very it's very cold there. I find it a very and I lived there for 14 years. I did stand up comedy there, and um, I, I just found it really like a cold environment in general compared to here. It's interesting you speak about the island. I, that's how we feel about Australia. We are this island, and we feel like we're a little bit more laid back as perhaps. Yeah the rest of the world are so no it's good good i wanted to check in and see how you're going so that's good to see where you're at you and i connected through dr nima ramani and i was doing his program the overview method and this vital piece designed by you the inner child work i'm i've been a demartini facilitator for two decades and that one piece russ that made all the difference to me um i was a performer and knowing that this inner child part of me needed to be seen and heard it made the difference to me as an agent and a producer to therefore then use that piece in how I work with my music artists. So what, what, first of all, thank you for that. It, it, it's a brilliant process. And I wanted to You're talk to you about that, that. How, how you sort of stumbled across that, what the process was, and I guess what the ripple effect has been for you personally after using that process. Yeah, well, I, I, I grew up in, in a family. My father was schizophrenic and bipolar. So the my family, family was pretty chaotic. And, you know, I I think a lot of us with, you know, artistic backgrounds, I was just saying I have eight guitars in this house. So it's, uh, you know, I consider myself an artist, a stand-up comedian, that kind of thing. I think a lot of us came from trauma. You know, I think trauma makes you, I'm not sure it makes you an artist, but I think it takes, puts you on that path. You know, I see a lot of, a lot of my fellow comedians, a lot of my fellow musicians, we had a fair amount of trauma in our background. And I think that just causes you to look at the world in a different way. And in a way it allows you this vehicle to have that inner child seen and heard by people specifically comedy for sure. Certainly as a musician, you can. And I think the real trick though, is to learn to identify your own inner child and give that attention to them rather than need it by proxy, rather than need it from some other people. And we have to get it from other people. It's just that if we're not giving it to ourselves and we're expecting it and we're trying to get it from other people, the artistic lifestyle can be very, very difficult because typically artists are down on themselves. They're hard on themselves. And, you know, if you're hard on yourself and then you're expecting to be fed by what's outside of you and, if you're fed by what's outside of you, great. You know, if you're a great artist and people love you and stuff, but when you're starting out and things aren't as, you know, when I started out as a stand-up comedian, <laughs> I wasn't very good at all. So, you know, it, it really, you get into this sort of, you know, artist way place where you're just in this trying to turn, you know, lead into gold and it takes a while. And and if you're on your own side, it's just so much easier. And, and I try and tell artists, it's like, can you learn, like, where do you feel the pain in your system? Like, where do you feel that alarm in your system? And when you can, when you can localize that alarm, that alarm that lights you up when you're upset about something, that's probably your younger self asking for your attention. So that's what the book is about. That's really what my, what my, and I know it's weird coming from a medical doctor. Absolutely. But that's kind of my jam. That's, that's what I, that's what I do is I try and get people to, 
to connect with their younger self. And usually that happens through trauma. And usually it happens through a feeling in your body that's localized somewhere, almost always between your chin and your pubic bone. And just, you know, I get people to go, go into a traumatic part of your life. Don't pick the worst ever, but go into a traumatic part of your life and then just scan your body and see see where that comes out. Because a lot of people will feel it around their heart. A lot of people will feel it in their throat. Interestingly, people that that weren't able to say what they wanted to say to a parent will have this alarm centered in their throat and, and they're kind of blocked. Singers, a lot of singers are, are, are trying to get something out that they couldn't get out otherwise. So it really, I really find artists fascinating as far as A, it, they tend to come from a background of uncertainty and alarm and B, how they, how they transform that into, you know, getting attention from themselves but like i'm saying is give the attention to yourself and it allows your art to just flow so much better it was great that you've actually mentioned that about singers and thank you for giving us that explanation russ because in our industry i'm not sure what it's like over there but in australia the incidence of throat cancer is hugely high um i myself had three tumors removed from my my thyroid and had my my throat cut And um, I believe that it it is about not speaking what's important to you, not actually saying the things that you want to say. And there's this amazing book that's been released this year called Musicians and Addictions. And this is in Australia. And there's all these stories from all these musicians talking about their addiction journey. I'll send you the link. It's amazing. When When you realize that we will get addict, addicted to alcohol, to sex, to drugs, to behaviours, instead of listening and connecting to that younger self. That is such a hallmark of our industry. Have you noticed that, that there's this, you'll look oh, outside. Talk, can you talk to me a little bit about what you've seen? I mean, I'm sure oh, you've seen absolutely. a lot of it. I mean, you know, I think what happens I, to a lot of us when we're younger is we don't, we don't get fed ourselves, and that's where the trauma comes from. So we don't, our, we don't feel good in our bodies. So we, were, we, we track up into our minds. So we start overthinking all the time. And in fact, the trauma is stored in our body. So why would we want to go back down there? So what we wind up doing is staying in our heads, overthinking things, and then trying to find a way to metabolize that. And if you don't have a way, like being an artist is a way to metabolize that. But again, you've got to really give it to yourself because if you don't feed yourself, you get, you, you get blocked. You know, when I wrote this book, you know, which I consider an artistic endeavor, the, the number of times that I just judged myself and said, Oh, you know, no one's going to want to read this. This is, you know, that's not making sense. Um, the number of times that I was blocked and then I would just get really down on myself. And then I would just not, not in a sort of a Pollyanna kind of way going, you know, how can you see the benefit of this struggle right now? And how can you support yourself through this struggle and how can you support that child in you that's afraid to show himself, which is basically what the book is about. How can you show him that it's okay? You know, you're not the five-year-old, you know, looking at his dad, wondering what the hell is going on anymore. You're an adult now. You can, you can, and you can take that little five-year-old beside you and kind of go, Hey, you know, this is, I can see what you're witnessing here and I'm with you now. Like I've got you now. And then as you do that, you can sort of merge into your real talent as an artist and and your full expression. Because while you're still down on yourself, I'll tell you, you'll never get to your full expression. While, I mean, it can be a really profound way of pushing yourself, but there is a point where it's just, it, it becomes more harm than good. You know, pushing yourself as an artist is great because, you know, we get into different frameworks. But when when you go too far, and I think coming back to your original point, I think that's where people get addicted because if they can't, if you can't give it to yourself through a normal, you know, person to person interaction, then the only other way to do it is through, you know, some sort of chemical stimulant, alcohol, drugs, whatever, sex, porn, whatever you, you have to, the only way you allow yourself to have pleasure is through this kind of artificial means because you're so used to not allowing yourself. to. So it, it kind of opens the gate to pleasure that you normally wouldn't allow yourself to have. And, and it's, it's almost like you, you allow that. That's the only way you'll allow pleasure because often when we have trauma as children, Allowing pleasure is just something that we don't like because we always know it's going to get pulled away from us, you know, especially if you grew up with an alcoholic parent or a parent who is, you know, inconsistent or whatever, you were afraid to be happy 
because that was get, that rug was going to get pulled out from underneath you. So it was easy to keep yourself at this kind of baseline of, of, you know, kind of dysphoria than it was to get really happy about something and then have it all taken away. I love that you brought up the whole pleasure thing, Russ, because so many artists that I've spoken to, their social activity is gigging, being on stage. Their yep. feeling of being loved is being on stage. Their feeling of connecting with people is being on stage. That's giving them a lot of their pleasure. Now, there's no gigs. We haven't had any meaningful gigs since the 13th of March. So, and I don't know what it's like over there in Canada, but in Australia, even though lockdown has almost finished, we've still got some major restrictions on how we connect and we celebrate. So yep. music businesses are at 10% capacity, right? Right. So 90% is still not happening because there's a $6,000 fine if you dance. Yeah. Every single person. Think about that. You can have 30,000 at the football, but you can have 60 people in a pub. So they're not going to hire live music. So you're yep. facing an extinction level event for this industry. So yep. I want to hear from you in terms of, and you've touched on it briefly, for anyone who's listening to this in this industry and they're going, well, shit, um, I can't, I've got loans for my production, I've got a mortgage, I've got a family, I can't necessarily pivot onto an online business. Yeah. How do I manage my anxiety facing the uncertainty and, you know, we're looked at as acceptable collateral damage. So in, in your, I guess, you as a medical doctor and in the field that you're in and in terms of this book, what would you say to people in this industry in terms of a strategy to get them through what's, what's coming? Well, it does give you a real excuse to, to finally look after yourself, you know, and I know it, it's very easy to get caught up in your head. Like, how am I going to pay my next bill? When's my next gig coming? You know, I'm not getting fed because in a way, when you're talking, sometimes when we get, I know stand up was an addiction for me. Totally. Right. So stand up was a way of, of getting acceptance, getting love, you know, enjoying myself, having fun. Um, but it, there was a, a dopamine rush to it. From a neuroscience point of view, there's a dopamine hit that we get from performing. And if we're not getting that, and that's kind of what's boosting us up, um, yeah, it's easy to get, to get really low. So the answer to that is always, and I know it sounds kind of, you know, Pollyanna or whatever, but it's really connecting with yourself. It's taking this time where you have to be kind of solo to really look into your, your past and go, how can, I, how can I connect with that younger part of me. I'm, one of the stories I tell in the book is that, you know, when I was about 12 years old, my dad tried to commit suicide. So the ambulance was taking him away to the hospital. And I remember watching the, the ambulance take him away. And, and what I do now is sometimes I'll go, I'll sit beside him in my mind and I'll go, you know, it must have been really hard for you when you were looking out that window and you felt completely alone, completely like nobody understood uh, you didn't know what was happening with your dad. And then, and then just wait and then just sort of see what he says back. And now I'm able to have a, a dialogue with him because, because I've, I've tried, you know, I've really tried to connect with him because for a long time I kind of ignored him. I was, you know, I had my own addiction, stand up comedy, um, that kind of thing, performing, that kind of thing. And I never really took the time to really connect with him I was always looking for gratification outside of him and outside of me. So when I commiserate, I call it commiserating, um, take a, something from your childhood that was really upsetting to you and then sit down beside that child and say, you know, it must have been really hard for you when, you know, you were standing up in front of the, the, the class and you couldn't remember your words and they all laughed at you. And then just wait and see, because it's all about, it's really all about connecting to yourself because the more connection you have for yourself, the less stress you'll feel. Because really the stress is coming from the fact, it's not coming from you as an adult so much. It's coming from that, that child in you that really struggled because it, when you, we really struggle, it takes us back to that place in childhood that we, we really struggled. And I like to say, you know, any major, any major overreaction is an age regression. So if you're freaking out, chances are you've transported yourself back to a, a place in time where you felt really uncertain, where you felt really unsafe. And it's the child in you that needs the reassurance. The adult kind of knows, you know, this is a terrible time, but things will get better. But the child doesn't because when the child was a child, they didn't know it was going to get better. They didn't know when this trauma was going to end. So it really is a great opportunity to find where that trauma is in your body. Like when you, when you, 
when you think I'm, I'm not going to have enough money to pay my bills, I can't feed my family or whatever. See if you can localize that in your body and find, because for me, I found it on LSD. That's why that's, that's what part of the book is about. And for me, I found it's kind of in my solar plexus. It's purple. It's sharp. It, it looks like uh, those uh, um, stalagmites that come up from the bottom of caves. Uh, it pushes up against my heart. It's hot. Um, and it, and it, and it hurts. Like there's an ache to it. Like it's not a, a like, and there's a bit of a burning pain to it too. So it took me a long time to really itemize exactly what I felt, but that's the same thing I felt when I was watching the ambulance take my father away. So I can use that feeling to connect to myself and know that that's the same feeling I felt when I was watching my dad go away. So once I do that and I commiserate with that younger part of me I was my nickname was Rusty when I was back then so I just have a little conversation and say Rusty it must have been really hard for you watching you know or being teased at school or you know having to present in front of the class and not having anything prepared and and, and just the embarrassment and just and waiting to see what he said back you know and just and trying to develop that relationship with him because I think that's really what's allowed me to drop a lot of my anxiety I mean I I'm still an artist. I still have it, but it's, it's allowed me this perspective on my anxiety that I know where it comes from now. You know, I know when I get anxious that I'm not connecting with myself. Like I know what that is. And we can use our, like I go up and, and put on a blues backing track and I've got two strats and a telly and I, and I play the crap out of those things, you know, and I really, and vibration is so important. And at the same time that I'm playing, I kind of bring my younger self along with that as well. Because, you know, that's when I, that's when we really, that's when we really connect to our childlike innocence and bring him along, you know, you know, make a, make a, um, a point to really include him in your artistic abilities. Like when you're, if you're having a great show and shows come back on, just, you know, go, go backstage and go and say, you know, this is great. You know, we are really having fun here. And just the more you can connect with that, that younger part of yourself that feels out of control the less stress you're going to feel. Now it's a very long answer and I hope it made sense, but no, kind of. No, I love it because it is all about parenting yourself. And on your website, you've got anxiety is unavoidable, but struggling is optional. And it's, you know, oftentimes I've had, I don't know, 20 versions of myself on my lap at different ages. Thinking, yeah. oh, it's a bit schizophrenic. Yeah. But it's sort of, you know, it, it once you get used to it, it changes the way that you feel when something happens and triggers you, you kind of check in. Yeah, it totally makes sense why you feel like that. So I think any musicians out there listening to this, you will totally get what Russ is talking about because it does make sense because we are all so connected to stories because we're expressing them as artists, right? Yeah. So those stories come from all those younger parts of ourselves. So look, I, I'm going to have um, the link to your website. So it's dr-russ.com. And yeah. I'll make sure everyone knows about the book because you've got great resources on your website, Russ. So yeah, show us the book. Can I try. Look, yeah, I think mm -hmm. anyone who's in the music industry probably needs to get a, a copy of that. Can you actually download it, or do you have do you only have physical versions? There, there is there is a Kindle version on Amazon, so you can get it uh -huh. if you have a Kindle app. You can get it. You can you know, I, I I do have people that have ordered it from New Zealand and from Australia, and they say it takes about six weeks you know i just released it on the 15th of october so it, it, it hasn't been out for very long um so my australian pals which i have surprisingly lots um <laughs> and new zealand pals too um they say you know they say it's going to take about four to six weeks for them to oh, get it so okay. but you can get it on you can get the electronic version almost immediately i think yeah i think I that, that's the way to go and i think look you put this um mp3 out during lockdown um, you shared yep. it on Facebook. I got to tell you, I played that bloody thing every day for four months, like every single night. And it made such a difference just because it was the actual shock of, oh my God, what is going on? And that really helped me with my meditation, my breath work. So thank you for that. My You're welcome. Was that the free one that I put out for COVID? That was or free one. it was yeah, it was it was just it's still out there. So people want it. They can go and download it. Yeah. Yeah, everyone and it's free. I'll make sure that I, I have all your connections. But look, Russ, I think anyone in the music industry is going to really get value from hearing your voice today because this is a story not just for the people you see on stage because for every person on stage, there's a couple hundred people out there making it happen. And without them, there's no yeah. soundtrack to humanity. 
and this is their voice and you've added your voice to this story and I'm I'm so grateful that you've taken the time. Thank you so much and good luck with the book. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks. It's uh, It's been quite the journey so far, for sure. And thank you for having me on the show. Oh, look, it was wonderful. And I will see you next time. Take care.